Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Setting Up and Monitoring Power Distribution and Audio with Richard Kindina. My name is Mallory Miznarsik and I'm the project manager here at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during this webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenter and he'll try to answer as many as possible at the end. This webinar will also be recorded and a link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. We encourage you to take a look at our different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional Training to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to Richard, the presenter for today's webinar. Richard is a freelance lighting professional, author, and trainer who has worked in concert tours, television, theater, motion picture production, and corporate events. He's also a columnist for Lighting Sound in America, Lighting Sound International, and Protocol Magazine. And I'll pass it over to you, Richard. Well, thank you, Mallory. Wow, that was quite an introduction. I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say after that. Uh, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I think this is gonna be a lot of fun. And um, I'm happy to have um, Brad Schiller on with us. Brad and I worked together for many years at High End Systems before he went off and became famous, working for Metallica and all sorts of exciting bands and stuff. So it's been great. Um, and Heather Bush also for Martin. Thanks for joining us and, and all of you people as well. So I appreciate you, everybody being here today. So we're going to talk about how you can safely set up a, pow a portable power distribution system and portable being the operative word. You know, if you're doing a, um, a shoot in a studio or, do, you know, uh, in a theater, and they have completely different set of rules for permanent installation. But if you're going doing a tour, if you're going to do a, a concert in a park or something, or setting up portable power, that's that's completely different. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, um, Brad, are you still there? I am here. <laughs> have, uh, tell me something, Brad. Have you ever been shocked before? I mean, electrically, not 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 like the time I wore a dress. Uh, that was different. Shocked. That. Yeah, for Halloween. But yes, I've been <laughs> electrically shocked as well. Okay. I have too. Have you ever been shocked more than once? Yes. Yeah, me too. I, I probably lost count how many times I've been shocked. Um, but it, it turns out that most people in North America have been shocked before in their life, yet we survived, obviously, right? Um, but we got lucky because there are some people who got shocked and didn't survive. And so... Um, and like we said, if you've been shocked more than once in the past, the odds, what are the odds of you being shocked again in the future? I would say they're pretty high. So um, if some people have been shocked in the past and didn't survive, and some people have, and there's a likelihood that you're, you could be shocked in the future, then don't, don't you want to know what makes the difference? You know, how do you survive a shock? I know I'm very interested in that. I pay a lot of attention to that and I try to take steps to protect myself because I think the odds of getting shocked in the future are probably pretty high. So there are things that I, that I want to know about how this all works, right? Well, you know, I've gathered some t statistics and it turns out that about 97% of electricians have been shocked or injured on the job. And I, do, I conduct these uh, classes a lot and I often survey the classes and I will ask, and in general, it's, you know, 90 plus percent of the classes that I, that I teach, um, uh, the people have been shocked at one point or the other. It's, in fact, it's pretty rare to have a class of, you know, 30 or 40, 50 people where nobody has ever been shocked before. And if there are people in that class that have never, ever been shocked before, we offer to fix that for them, but nobody's ever taken us up on it. Yeah. You know, uh, and I don't mean, <laughs> I'm being silly, of course, I, I don't mean to be flippant about it. It's, it's serious business, right? But the point is that many people have been shocked in the past and survived, yet others didn't, weren't so lucky. And, you know, lots of people have died because of electricity. So we want to know what's, uh, what makes the difference between those two. So, and I, you know, I do a lot of research on the, um, OSHA website, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration.gov website. And their job is to make sure you have a safe and uh, healthy work environment. And anytime somebody's injured on the job, they will 
send somebody out to investigate and then they write a report. And anybody can go to OSHA.gov and look at those accident statistics. And if you peruse them, what you'll find is that um, there are a whole lot of uh, electrocutions. And when I say electrocution, I mean death by electricity um, on in the average year. And now some of the statistics I've read have, have said that there are, you know, um, a hundred hundreds or a thousand or so electrocutions every year. But in my, based on what I've, what I've looked at and what I've found, I think it's probably in the range of a couple of hundred. So we want to know what causes those or, or you know, what causes the fatality if you get shocked and how to prevent that in the future right? So it turns out that if you are shocked electrically, how badly you're injured depends on how much current goes through your body. The voltage influences the amount of current, but it, it, it's not the determining factor. It's how much current goes through your body. So for example, um, I know people who have been struck by lightning on more than one occasion, and yet they survived. And lightning can be hundreds of thousands, if not a million volts or more. But because they were, uh, they got lucky <laughs> and very little current actually passed through the body, they actually survived, you know? So the key is how much current flows your body. The same thing with the taser. If you, uh, you know, if you look at the specs for a taser, it'll say it's something like 100,000 volts, 120,000 volts, but the amount of current is very tightly controlled. So, you know, the idea is not to, it, to kill you, but to stun you. So by limiting the amount of current, and we're talking micro amps, millionths of an amp, then it'll get your attention and it'll hurt, but it's not designed to kill you. The other thing that determines how badly you're injured would be the length of time that you're being shocked. If you can let go really quick, then uh, you can withstand higher amounts of current. Um, and so I read recently that the typical reaction time for being shocked is actually a second and a half, which is a pretty long time. So, and then also the path that current takes through your body. And so it's especially critical that um, you, you are aware of your position, of your body position relative to the electrical power. And you try to position yourself so that in the event that you do get shocked, you, current does not flow through your vital organs. So if you watch some of these uh, old time electricians when they're working on electrical circuits, sometimes they'll put their right hand in their back pocket and work with their left hand. And I used to think they did that because they were lazy and they're just too relaxed, but they're really trying to protect themselves because if they short something out to their hand, it'll, the current will go through the left, or sorry, it's the other way around. You want to go through the right part of your body where away from your heart, that's the main thing. So you want to try to keep current away from your vital organs, your heart, your brain, your lungs, your kidneys, your liver, and you'll have a much better odds of survival that way. Now, if you know anything about circuits, you may know something called Ohm's law. Ohm's law spells out the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. And so if you get shocked, the resistance that your body presents to the circuit controls the amount of current. So it is the voltage. So the amount of current flowing through your body is actually the voltage that you're shocked by divided by the resistance. And if you understand math, you know that the higher the resistance, the lower the current for the same amount of voltage. So the idea being that if you want to survive a shock um, or, or potential shock, you want to increase your resistance as much as possible. How do you do that? Well, it's really simple. You wear gloves and you wear rubber soled shoes and preferably your shoes are um, designed to withstand electric shock and they're called EH rated or electrical hazard rated. So the next time you buy shoes for your job, you know, work shoes, then just look at the specs and make sure that they say EH rating. And that ensures that uh, at a particular voltage, it'll only allow very small amounts of current to pass through for a very long time, as long as they're dry, right? If you're standing in a puddle of water, then all bets are off. So you want to, you know, try to keep everything dry, right? Um, but if you can do that, if you wear gloves and if you wear EH rated shoes, then you're protecting the two most common points of contact when you get shocked, which are your hands and your feet. So that, that's, that will go a long way towards protecting you from getting shocked. Or even if you do get shocked, you know, you might feel the tingle, but it's not going to kill you, which is the main thing, you know? So how much current does it take to harm you? Well, this is a chart that shows you 
the human reaction to electrical current. And the key points here are when you start to get up around 20 to 30 milliamps, then that's the one, two, three, fourth, fourth row down. Um, that's where you start to lose control of your muscles. Sometimes when you get shocked, your muscles freeze or your muscles seize and you can't let go. And that can be very dangerous because remember we said that the amount of time that you're, that you're shocked is one of the determining factors as to how well you survive. So if you could have a quick reaction time and you can let go, then you're going to fare much better than if you, if your muscles seize and you get stuck on that conductor and, and, you know, uh, I do a lot of research online and um, I don't <laughs> really recommend this, but if you go to YouTube and you type in stage electrocution, then there's a lot of videos of people getting shocked. I do not like to watch them because especially the, the gruesome ones, the more gruesome ones. But, but if I just want to know, you know, have there been any new uh, electric, uh, stage electrocutions, then, you know, I, that's, that's a good place to go to look. And sometimes you will see people who are holding a microphone and they can't let go of it because their muscles have seized, right? So as an electrician, one of the tricks that you learn is if you want to uh, say, for example, I often recommend that you, you know, heat is a byproduct of, of electricity. So if you want to know if a connector is melting, rather than grab it with your, with your hand, you want to use the back of your hand and feel to see if it's getting too hot. Because if you use the front of your hand and you have um, broken insulation and you start to get shocked and your muscles can seize on it like a microphone and you can't let go, that's very dangerous. So around 20, 30 milliamps. Anything below that in terms of the level of current is probably survival, it might hurt, but you can probably let go. Anything above that um, can be very dangerous as well. So now the, uh, the previous chart, this chart that we're looking at, um, tells you the amount of current, but it doesn't say much about the element of time. And we said that time, the length of time that you're being shocked has a big influence on how likely you are to survive. This chart is better in that regard because it shows you the amount of current across the bottom and the length of time across the side. And it's divided into zones. And so the, everything in the blue, the green, the yellow, that's survivable. When you start getting into the red zone, that's where it could potentially be lethal. So that's the area we want to avoid, right? And where does that start? Well, if you look at the line, you know, where the first red line starts and, and trace it down, you'll see it's a little above 30 milliamps. And 30 milliamps is 0 0.03 amps. It's not very much current, right? But that is for a 10 second shock. And when you're being shocked, 10 seconds can be a really, really long time. You know, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, that's, that's way too long. I'd, I'd have been out of there long, long ago, you know. So it's more realistic to look at where does that red line start um, with a reaction time of about one second. And that, that would be around 40 milliamps. So 40 milliamps is 0 0.04 amps. And that's where... It, you start to get into the red zone and that's where it could potentially be lethal. So that's the number that we want to avoid it, you know, uh, if we accidentally get shocked. If you understand circuits and you understand Ohm's law, then you, um, the next logical question to ask, if we know we want to avoid 40 milliamps and more, the next logical question to ask is, well, if I'm being shocked, the resistance is the, the resistance of, of my body. So how many ohms is the human body. So that's a reasonable question to ask. And this chart attempts to answer that question. Now you can see there's a lot of variables here. A lot of, you know, a lot of things can change. The, the probably the single most um, drastic change is from the difference between dry skin and wet skin. So if you look at the numbers, remember we want the resistance to be as high as possible if you get shocked. So the current is as low as possible. So if you look at the dry skin column, those numbers are much higher than the, the, col the numbers in the wet skin column, which means that if your skin is wet and you get shocked, your resistance is much lower, the current's much higher, it's much more dangerous, which is why we say water and electricity don't mix. We want to you know, keep those separate. So, And then um, as you go down the chart, you'll see that the the numbers get lower and lower, which means it's more dangerous, which, and the reason is that there's more surface area of contact of your skin. So if you, if you put a finger 
on a on a hot conductor you know say you've got you're wiring a circuit and you're twisting wire nut or tw- twisting the wires together to put a wire nut on it and somebody turns on a circuit breaker then a finger touch if your skin is dry could mean that the resistance of your body is between 40,000 ohms and 10 10 10 uh, sorry 1 million ohms and if you do the math at 120 volts then the 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 amount of current that will flow through your body is low enough that it will be in the green zone of that IEC chart, which means that is survivable. So you have a good chance of surviving if you're only touching a circuit, a hot conductor with your finger. Now, you know, if you're in Europe, it's a different story because the voltage there is twice as high as 240 volts instead of 120, which means there's twice as much current and it's twice as lethal. So you especially have to be careful if you are working in Europe. Now, as you go down the chart, you'll see the numbers get lower and lower. That means it's more dangerous. And if you look at the line that says uh, two hands around a one and a half inch pipe, well, that's a very common scenario in our world. You know, in portable power distribution, we use trusses. We use uh, pipes in theater, schedule 40, one and a half inch pipes. Um, You know, sometimes there's scaffolds, sometimes there's uh, catwalk railing. So, um, and that says that if your skin is dry, then the uh, resistance of the human body is between 500 ohms and 1500 ohms. And so if you look, if you take that middle number, the median number is 1000 ohms. And that's not untypical, um, I think, for uh, those of us who work in this, in this environment. Now, that's if your skin is dry. If your skin is wet, then the numbers are about half of that. So now we're talking 500 ohms. So 500 to 1000 ohms. Now, if you get shocked by 120 ohms, it's much more serious and now we're talking about it being in the yellow or red zone. So um, how would you protect yourself against that? Well, you wear gloves. I know that gloves aren't ideal. When you wear gloves, you lose some finger dexterity. And, you know, it's hard to pick up small nuts and bolts and, uh, you know, do uh, delicate tasks, you know, with your fingers. But it could save your life. And, and if you shop around for gloves like I have, I'm a, I'm a bit of a, a glove connoisseur. <laughs> I've got several different gloves. I have one pair of gloves I use for unloading trucks. I have another pair of gloves that anytime the, that I'm handling cables and the switch is on and the cables are energized and there's voltage on them, then I'm outcome my uh, thick leather gloves. And I found a pair of buffalo skin gloves where the seam is small enough that it doesn't mess up your finger dexterity too much. They're reasonably priced. They're about 35 bucks and they seem to work well. So I always wear my gloves if I'm going to be handling live conductors, because you never know when the insulation might be broken and you might accidentally come in contact or with, with uh, you know, with voltage or if there's a fault and there's actually voltage on a piece of trust, you know, uh, I mentioned that Brad and I used to work at high end systems and before it was high-end systems, it was actually called Blackstone Audiovisual. And we installed lighting, sound, and video systems in nightclubs all over the, the country. And there was a club, used to be a club in Austin called Austin Nights. And it was kind of the showroom for Blackstone. And it had a bunch of uh, truss pods that articulated on chain motors. And, and they had a bunch of pin spots were wired into them. And I was one of the, I was on the installation crew. And uh, one day I was on the top of a very tall, like probably a 15 foot ladder, 16 foot ladder. And we were hardwiring in these pin spots. And uh, so we'd strip the wires, twist them together, put a wire nut on it and move on to the next one. Well, I'd finished wiring one. I was going to the next pin spot and I was trying to reposition myself. And I grabbed hold of one piece of truss and reached over and grabbed another piece of truss. And the second piece of truss had a, a fault on it. It had 120 volts on it. So I grabbed two pieces of truss that had 120 volts between it. Um, And I was really fortunate. Number one, I was able to let go because I had quick reaction. I was young back then. And number two, I was really lucky I didn't fall off the the ladder and uh, injure myself badly. So um, I can, you know, I count my blessings every day I wake up and, you know, that's just one incident. But had I been wearing gloves, then yes, it would have been harder to strip the wires and twist the wires together and put a wire nut on it, but it's, it's possible. But that uh, instead of getting shocked, I probably might have felt a tingle, but I certainly would not have gotten a bad shock. So um, 
that's why I say wearing gloves is a, is a great idea. Okay. Uh, the other thing you might notice from this chart is that it says if your hand or foot is immersed in water, then those numbers are very low, right? So if you're working around water and, and you have electrical circuits, and it happens a lot in mo motion picture production um, and some other instances as well, but be sure that those circuits have GFCI protection. We'll talk about GFCIs a little bit later on, okay? Now, and then lastly, the uh, it's the, that last line down there, look at that last line. It says, the resistance of the human body internal, excluding skin, is between 200 and 1,000 ohms. Now, what in the world does that mean? What it means is that it, you know, your skin it has pretty high resistance, especially if you have calluses on your fingers and your hands. Um, but if, if your skin is pierced, then the resistance drops drastically and you're much more susceptible to electrocution. You know? So what can happen is if you're close to higher voltage, like 480 volts, it can arc over to you and that arc can then pierce your skin. And now your, your uh, resistance has dropped dramatically and a lot of current will flow. And that's very dangerous. So how can you protect your skin from being pierced? Wear gloves, wear thick leather gloves. So there's another argument for wearing a good pair of thick leather gloves. If you are an electrician, if you're setting up portable power distribution equipment. Um, now here's a little extra, here's a little uh, thought uh, exercise, thought experiment. Um, what is the least amount of current that could potentially be fatal? So um, it says, you know, a lot of research I've done says that a shock in the range of 100 to 200 milliamps is most likely to be fatal. So um, that's a little bit higher than what we've been talking about. And, but if you think about 100 milliamps, that's 0.1 amps. And for a resistance of 1,000 ohms, that would, that's only, that's only uh, 100 volts. So 100 volts, um, if, you, if you present a resistance of 1,000 ohms, would cause 100 milliamps to flow through your body. That could potentially be lethal. And then ask yourself this question. Um, the IEC chart says that as little as 40 milliamps could cause heart fibrillation, and that could potentially be fatal. That's where the red line starts. So how much voltage would it cause if your resistance was 1,000 ohms to cause 40 um, to cause, yeah, 40 milliamps of current to flow through your body. Well, you do the math, it works out to be 40 volts, 40 volts. Now, the first time I looked at those numbers, I questioned myself. I said, did I do the math right? That just doesn't sound right. Can somebody really die from 40 volts? Well, I've done research and the answer is yes. People can and have died from as little as 40 volts. It's been documented. It's not, um, it's, it's not highly probable, but it is possible. There, are, there have been documented cases where people have died at 40 volts. And I bring this up because in 2014, November 22nd, 2014, I'll always remember that date because that's when Augustine Briolini died. Augustine was the leader of a band called the Krebs. 22-year-old kid had a, had a, a wonderful um, um, uh, career ahead of him. They just recorded an album. They went into, uh, they were going to do a tour. The very first stop, they went into a theater and they were setting up and during sound check, he's an electric guitar player, was an electric guitar player and the lead singer songwriter. Um, and he touched the microphone and it killed him. And when that happens and I've, and I hear about it, then I want immediately want to know what went wrong. And more importantly, how can we prevent that from happening in the future? So I went and did research, and, and usually the answer is that there's a faulty ground. And in this case, the, the ground was lifted with a ground lift adapter. It's actually a grounding adapter. We call them ground lift adapters because we use them the wrong way. They should never, ever be used to lift the ground, and that cost this uh, young person his life. And so um, when, when that happened, then um, I went online to do some research. And you can go, there's all kinds of you know, forums. And I went to, I think it's called the Blue Room Audio Forum. And somebody had posted on that because uh, um, there have been, you know, other people have, have been in the same situation and survived. And somebody posted on there and said, well, it couldn't have been 120 volts because I've been shocked by 120 volts and 120 volts isn't enough to kill you. And that's so wrong because it absolutely is enough voltage to kill somebody under the wrong circumstances. If you've been shocked by 120 volts and you survived, that's only because 
the circumstances just happen to be in your favor on that day. So don't ever think that just because I'm working with 120 volts or less that um, it could not be fatal. Now, people that often ask me about phantom power, you know, phantom voltage is 48 volts. Is that enough to kill you? Well, um, in that instance, no. Why? Because the, the, the transformer is too small to provide enough current. So there's not enough energy behind it. So what typically what happens if, is that if you get shocked by 48 volts of phantom power, the voltage actually drops because there's not enough energy behind it to drive enough current that would, that would cause you um, severe injury. So it's kind of like a taser, you know, it's, it's a high enough voltage, but it's very, very little current. So uh, I wouldn't worry too much about phantom power. Now, when you're setting up, um, when you're setting up portable power distribution, then uh, the certain things that uh, you should know. And, um, you know, first of all, I hope that um, if you are um, setting up a power distribution system, if you are not experienced, I highly recommend that you certain things you should not do, like, uh, you know, terminating cam uh, feeder cable and energizing a switch and until you have um, experience with, you know, maybe you can, um, you get the training, you get the proper training and you uh, kind of apprentice with somebody or work with somebody who has the experience so they can make sure that you're safe while you're doing it. But, you know, the first step is to get the training and that's what this is all about. So let's talk about how you properly set up portable power. So first of all, every venue that you're uh, working in is going to have a source of power and you typically it's either a feeder transformer like this or it's going to be a portable power generator. They, they function exactly the same. Of course, in different ways, you know, feeder transformers fed from the uh, uh, transmission lines, whereas portable power generator takes diesel energy and converts it to electrical energy. But what, you know, the, the first thing that, um, that you should know is, do I have sufficient supply, right? So every feeder transformer has a nameplate on it. This is a picture of a nameplate um, from a transformer that I took, and it will tell you the uh, KVA. So in the um, upper left-hand corner here, you can see where it says 300 KVA. And now that is the, um, the rating of this feeder transformer. Now, what's important to us is how many amps can it output? And there's a simple formula to figure out the amps. And that is that you divide by the volts, you take the volt amps and you divide by the volts to get the amps. And so if you, if you know how math works and you pay attention to the units of measure, volt amps divided by volts equals amps. It's real simple. So you could say 300, and the K stands for thousand. So 300,000 divided by 120 volts is equal to and that would be um, 2,400 amps. Now that's the total number of amps. Now typically, and this is a prime example, this is gonna be a three phase transformer. And you can tell by, well, it says three phase right there on the nameplate. So, so that, you know, that's all you need to know, but typically there's a connection diagram and the output here is, is indicated by X1, two, and three. So those are your three hot, uh, phase legs. And so you know that each of those uh, outputs one third of the total. So if it's 2,400 amps total, 2,400 divided by three is 800 amps per phase or, or per leg. But typically, you know, you don't have to do the math uh, if you memorize these numbers, because typically a lighting system will, will be connected to a 400 amp three phase switch. That's a total of 12, um, yeah, 1200 amps all together. And that requires, it's connected to a 150 KVA uh, feeder transformer. Now, a lot of times audio systems are connected to a 200 amp three phase switch. And those are connected to a 75 KVA feeder transformer. And sometimes you will find a 100 amp three phase switch. And those have, those should be connected to at least a 37.5 KVA feeder transformer. So if you memorize those numbers, um, that's what you need to know. So you can you should check out your feeder transformer, make sure you have enough power uh, for the switch and for your needs. Uh, also, by the way, 
for 400 amp service, 400 amp three phase service, you can use four aught conductor. Now we'll talk about the cables a little bit later on, but the feeder cable that you're that, that connects to it should be the wire gauge should be at uh, four aught. That's it's going to say four with the slash and a zero, and a 200 amp three phase switch you use two aught, and with the 100 amp switch you can use number two wire, and it's often called banded because they'll take all five conductors and tape them together and uh, make a complete set and we call that banded. Um, so we're going to skip over the double neutrals and K ratings. Uh, a feeder transformer should be completely silent and pretty, um, pretty cool running, relatively speaking. If, it, if you find a feeder transformer is very hot and, and, you know, that just comes from experience or if you have certain instruments to measure it, like an infrared camera, or if it's very loud and again, you know, relative to other transformers. So if you have four transformers in a row and one of them, you know, if they're all loaded to the same amount and one of them is louder and hotter than the others, that's your clue that that feeder transformer is in failure mode. And it's probably not a bad idea to take it out of service if you have that ability or not use it. If you can, you know, shed your load and put it on the other feeder transformers. But, you know, they should be relatively um, run relatively cool and relatively quiet. That picture you, you, that you see up there, that's a movie shoot that I was on once where the, <laughs> we, we, uh, as soon as the feeder transformer was energized with no load connected to it, no circuit breakers on, the thing was super hot, super loud. And so that's why the tech had to come out. That was an Agreco uh, feeder transformer. So Agreco sent the tech out and to look at it. And, you know, he basically looked at it and said, yeah, we need a new feeder transformer. So they just uh, had a new one out there that afternoon. So now while you're setting up your portable power distribution equipment, it's super important that you inspect all your gear as you're laying it out. Um, because you see, um, you, you can find that, you know, we're, we're really rough on portable equipment. We, you know, we, we uh, toss it out on the, on the ground. We step on it. We run forklifts over it. Um, you know, um, we're, we're often in a hurry. We don't properly connect it. So it overheats and, you know, we drive it really hard. We run it in the, in the rain, in the mud, in the heat, in the sun, and all of these things have an effect, have a, you know, they, they wear on it. And then at the end of the gig, uh, it used to be when I first started in the lighting industry, well, we used gas back then, but when we converted to electrical, um, you know, people didn't like to use electrical tape to, to secure cables to trust. Now it's, it's fairly common practice, but what happens at the end of the gig, everybody's in a hurry. So they fly the truss in and then people take their utility blades and they start slicing all of the um, electrical tape. And then they end up slicing the jacket of the feeder cable like that. And if that is not, if you don't catch that, if the shop doesn't catch that and they send it out to the next gig and you're setting it up and you turn it on, now you've got a problem because that is a shock hazard right there. You know, there's five ways that we protect ourselves against the hazards of electricity. One is insulation, there's isolation, there's circuit breakers, there's grounding, and there's GFCIs. And if the insulation is broken, especially on feeder cable, you know, there is no inner insulation. There's only an outer jacket. If that gets cut all the way to the copper, that is a shock hazard. And it's a big conductor, so it's, it's uh, potentially dangerous. Again, that's why I wear... I wear gloves anytime these cables are energized. And uh, so, but you know, the things to look for would be cuts, scrapes, um, cracks, um, punctures, uh, burn marks like this rainbow color. That's a sign that that has been very hot and then it's cooled off. You know, if you see metal with that rainbow color burned into it, then keep an eye on that. I'm not saying take it out of service, but I'm saying once you energize everything, turn things on, um, make sure that that point of connection is not overheating. So, and um, hopefully you have some tools for that. So these are all the things you look for. Um, the, you know, the, the cable is, has an insulation on it. As soon as that insulation is made, it starts breaking down. And there's certain things that can accelerate the, the breakdown. And that would be water, heat, mechanical stress, UV from, you know, being outside, um, chemicals and oil residue can all attack the jacket and accelerate the aging of that. So what you'll find is that it starts cracking 
it starts breaking apart. If you look at any cable that's been in existence for any length of time under a microscope, what you'd find is microscopic cracks in those. And as the uh, jacket, you know, that's basically plastic as it dries, as it ages, it dries out and the cracks get, cracks get deeper and deeper and deeper. And eventually it crumbles, you know, over time. Now a cable should last a good long time, 20, 30 years or more, if you take care of it. On the other hand, if you abuse it, <laughs> you know, if you toss it in the truck without protection, if you, if you run a, a forklift over it constantly, uh, if you reuse it out in the sun and it's not rated for outdoor use, it's going um, to, it's going to break down quicker. Okay. So uh, pinholes, I, I was once working a pre-production for a tour and um, we at, while we were at the console programming, I noticed the dimmer tech milling around the dimmer, uh, dimmer beach with his, with his uh, voltmeter. You know, it's two probes for his vol- voltmeter. And this is back in the day before we had nice distros with voltmeters on them and, and before there were test ports on the distros. And he wanted to meter the voltage. He couldn't find a place to put his probe. So he just took the jacket of the feeder cable and he stabbed the uh, probe through the jacket of the of the feeder cable. Now he's just violated the very first way we protect ourselves against the hazards of electricity. And that is he put a hole in the insulation, you know, and on the next gig, that pinhole, you know, if you run that feeder cable through the wet grass and some barefoot kid steps on, it's going to send him to the hospital, you know? So, so look for those things. You look, you know, inspect your gear, look for, you're looking for pinholes, cuts, scrapes, cracks, broken connectors, broken wires, uh, here's an example of a of a show I was working on where I found a staple through the jacket of the insulation, and that made contact with the um, with the copper. You know, so if you turn that on now, there's 120 volts on that relative to ground on that uh, staple. If you're using it in the states, um, this is another example of a show that I worked on where this feeder cable came straight off the truck. And I told my crew, be on the lookout for these things. And one person brought this to me and said, here's what I found. And I looked at it. You can see, you can plainly see the copper there, right? So I took some um, self-vulcanizing silicon rubber tape, which is, I I always carry this around with me for this exact reason. And it goes by different trade names. There's rescue tape, there's F4 tape, there's 3M, um, you know, there's Scotch 70, but it has a backing on it. You peel the backing off. And you stretch it and you wrap it. And every wrap is, is uh, supposed to be good for a thousand volts of insulation. So if you wrap it a couple of times, that's pretty good. Now, silicon rubber is not very durable. It's pretty soft and, you know, it feels really nice, but it's not very durable. So th- what I'll do then is I'll put some uh, electrical tape over the top of that because electrical tape is vinyl and that's much more durable. And now you have a temporary solution to get you through the show. You don't have to put it back on the truck. And on this particular show, we were running short on feeder cable because somebody miscounted. But, um, you know, if you, um, if you have the time and you have the, um, the materials, you can, you can temporarily patch it, but then, uh, make sure. So you cover it with electrical tape, make sure you mark it so that when it goes back to the shop, they'll know what the issue is and they can, you know, and I think the, uh, the best fix for this, you cut it into two pieces of cable. Now I've, I've had people tell me that there are permanent fixes for broken in jacket on feeder cable. I've never uh, used that or seen it, but, um, I'm told it does exist. So if you have the right equipment, maybe it can be fixed uh, permanently. The other thing you want to look for is missing ground term, especially ground terminals. That is so important that grounding pin right there can mean the difference between somebody living and somebody dying. Just, you know, that's what happened to Augustine Briolini is that somebody lifted the ground. So it's the same effect as cutting off the grounding pin or pulling it out. Like in this, this particular instance. So when I find cables like that, then I always carry side cutters with me, some dikes, diagonal cutters, and I, I'll cut off the male connector. So it cannot be put into service. That's super important. You also want to look for, Burn marks on connectors, that's a bad sign because that burn mark means that it's been arcing and that arcing is going to oxidize the copper or the, uh, the metal, which increases the resistance and that increases the heat and it becomes a vicious cycle and eventually that's, that whole connector is going to melt down. So if you see something like this, you take it out of service and you don't use it. 
look for burn marks. Um, you know, this, um, these stage pin connectors, these flat connectors are notorious for that because the pins get compressed. And unless you're constantly maintaining them and checking to make sure that they're not too compressed and they're not, they're not going to make a good connection. It's going to be high heat, uh, high resistance, high heat, and eventually it's going to melt the whole connector. Um, look for uh, broken nibs in the cam lock connector. So the way cam locks work is you insert them, you twist them, and there's a channel in there with the nib to stop it. That you know that that limits the travel on it. And I've seen plenty of those that have been worn down or broken off. So look inside of those, make sure that they're good. In, in order to be code compliant. Cables have to be marked with the wire gauge, the cable type, and the temperature rating. The wire gauge is important. You want to make sure, especially with, with feeder cables in North America, because they're individual cables. So you have five different cables. They should all be the same wire gauge, except for the ground. The ground can be smaller to a degree. So it is, um, it, it is code compliant to have four-aught conductor, but the ground can be um, number two wire. So or uh, two aught wire, I should say. And so uh, you wanna check and make sure because there's different types of cable. There's type W, there's type SC, uh, there's type um, PPT and PPE, and they all have different thicknesses of the jacket. So it's really hard to distinguish between different wire gauges if they are not the same cable type. And you will see the cable is stamped, it's silk screened on or it's stamped indent printed on the cable. And sometimes it's hard to read, but you know, somewhere along that length of cable, it will be legible. And it's important to look at it, read it, and make sure that all the cable sets match. Otherwise, you could end up with a problem. Um, the cable type is also important, and I'll, I'll show you uh, where you can find that a little bit later on. The temperature rating is important. That's the melting point of that jacket. And so if you have an infrared camera, you can monitor it and make sure that you're not going to exceed the melting point. Okay. Now, as far as stinger cables go or extension cords, what we should be using for portable applications is type S, which is extra hard usage cords and cables. If you go down to Lowe's or Home Depot, chances are when you buy an extension cord, it's a type SJ, which is junior hard service cords. Now those, those uh, type SJ is not intended to be run along the ground um, because if you step on it or if you run a golf cart over it, a forklift over it, it's likely to break the jacket. So you don't want to do that. Um, if you do use type SJ, you can use it. The new code says you can, but it needs to be supported by a rigid structure. If you're using it outdoors, it should be type O, which is oil resistance because there's, uh, there's oil residue in the parking lot in the street. And uh, should also be type W, should, that has a UV inhibitor as well. So um, I think, um, how much time do we have left? Can somebody tell me? Because I want to make sure. You're good. You're good on time. But, yeah, but I need to know how much time because I want to skip down. I want to make sure that we cover um, GFCIs and ground loops. Well, so, what I mean, Richard, is you can use as much time as you want. There's no. Oh, work. thank you. Thank you. Okay, very good. All right. Um, so, so in the National Electrical Code, it'll tell you the 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 letter type and its intended purpose, and really should pay attention to that. So, the prime example being: do not use welding cable for feeder cable, and that's because welding cable is designed for a fifty percent duty cycle. In our shows, we don't we use it for more than fifty percent of the, uh, of a, of a duty. So that means that out of every twenty minutes, it's only conducting for ten minutes, which is the way you would use a welder. But it's not the way you would use a lighting rig or an audio rig. You know, it's on when it's on, it's conducting. So that's a hundred percent duty cycle. And the issue is that the strands are so fine that they could um, they could fuse if if they overheat. So you don't want to use welding cable. It's not only is it a code violation, it's just not very safe. It's not very smart. So, and I, I know there are production companies out there. There are places that still have to this day welding cable because it used to be the, the, um, the only kind of four-aught cable, flexible, portable power cable you could get. So before 1986, that's what everybody, uh, 84, that's what everybody used. But that, it should have been taken out of service long ago. And today we use type SC, we use type PPE or PPT or type W for feeder cable. 
Okay. Um, this is a picture I took at a show I did where we did, uh, this was a week long corporate event and we had, uh, uh, several theater transformers and every one of them was being fed power by welding cable and it clearly says welding cable on there. And I didn't catch it. And that was my bad. I should have caught it, but uh, there was a third party vendor who was supplying all the feeder cable. And I didn't, I didn't, uh, we were kind of, uh, you know, under the gun time-wise. So I didn't uh, have the luxury of double checking their work, but had I seen this when they loaded it off the truck, I would have asked them to put it back on the truck and get some proper feeder cable, you know, and, you know, you try not to be a jerk about it, but you know, it's, it's kind of important, you know, safety. Yeah. is an issue. When, one of the first things I, I was taught when I got in the lighting industry was um, if you're, when you're setting up your distribution equipment, if there's, if there's excess uh, feeder cable, then do not, whatever you do, don't, do not coil it. Now, my background I, is that I studied electrical engineering at the University of Texas. And so I know, you know, we learned a lot about inductance and inductors and a coil of wires and inductors. So it made perfect sense to me that if you coil the excess feeder cable, what you're doing is you're building an inductor, which you don't want to do because that causes all kinds of problems. So we've always been taught to figure eight the, the excess feeder cable and to avoid that problem. Now, for many, many years, I would say decades, I ran under the assumption that the reason we don't coil excess feeder cable is because an inductor would cause the power factor of the entire system to drop, and that would cause more current to flow, and that could, could cause the whole system to overload. And But it turns out, you know, when I started uh, teaching ETCP prep courses, and we started doing hands-on workshops, and we we're actually setting up equipment in these classes, and running tests, you know, one of the things I wanted to do was, well, let's see what happens if we coil the cable, you know, fun, right? Let's do an experiment. So we'd set up these systems and we'd coil up the feeder cable and I, and I would meter it and I would expect to see the power factor drop and the current to rise as we coil the cable. And guess what? It never happened. It turns out that the jacket is so thick that it doesn't make a good inductor. You need to have, you know, inductors are made with what's called magnet wire which is bare copper wire, you know, solid wire that has a varnish on it so that when they coil it up, it's really close together and it really in, uh, in, inducts, so to speak. Is that a verb? But I just made it one. But um, the point is um, that it turns out that that's not the reason we don't coil feeder cable, but there is a very good reason not to do it. And I'm not saying go out, go out and coil your feeder cable. What I'm saying is what I learned is that when you coil up the feeder cable, then you can start to feel, you can literally feel the ground start to vibrate from the magnetism. And if you grab the, the conductor, you'll feel it vibrating at 60 hertz. And if you take your amp meter, you know, your clamp meter, normally you have to open the jaws and clamp a conductor to get a reading, but you don't even need, even need to open the jaws. If you just dip it in the center of the coil, the numbers will, will start climbing. So there's a really, really strong magnetic field there. And so that's really why we don't coil our excess feeder cable, because if we create a giant magnet, it's going to wreak havoc on the audio system and the video system, and sometimes even the lighting system, if you have DMX controlled cables close to that magnetic field. And that is what drives audio techs crazy. So as a courtesy, we try to spread out the magnetism. Now, does figure eight um, do work to... Uh, to uh, get rid of the magnetism? Well, yes and no. I mean, taken as a whole, because one side of the figure eight, the magnetism is in one direction. The other side, it's in the opposite direction. And taken as a whole, the magnetic field cancels out. But really, you do have two separate fields of strong magnetic fields. So you have local magnetism. And if you run audio cables near those, you're still going to have problems. So we try to separate our power and our signal cables to, to have a cleaner system. That's one way to, uh, to uh, ensure clean audio. Uh, when, you're, um, when you set up your power distribution system, you're gonna lay out your cables, you're gonna lay out your portable power distribution units, and you have your feeder, there's basically two parts to your system. You have your feeder circuits, which has the feeder cable. Those are the big cables like she's connecting here. And then you have your branch circuits, which are your stinger cables, your extension cords, and your socopex, those are all branch circuits. And the distro is in between. 
So the, um, the idea being that when you are terminating your feeder, that can be very dangerous. You have to be very careful because the switch that you're connecting it to, you know, the, the big gray box in the wall with the handle on the side, that's called a switch. It can be very dangerous. There's, there's, it has big conductors. It has big bus bars in it. And if something malfunctions then and you, and you energize it, there's going to be an explosion and a fire and people can get hurt. They have gotten hurt. So that's what we're trying to look out for. So I highly recommend that you work in pairs. So one person should terminate the cables color to color. So green goes to green, white to white, black to black, red to red, blue to blue. The second person should come along and verify that it is connected properly color to color and that the cam lock connectors are inserted properly and twisted all the way because depending on the brand, some of them go 120 degrees, some go 180 degrees. So you want to make sure they're properly terminated. And before you even do that, you need to verify, I need to rearrange my PowerPoint, but before you um, terminate your feeder, you need to make sure that the switch is off and that there's no voltage there because the last thing you want to do, never ever uh, terminate, connect cables while the voltage is on. That's how uh, I think I may have a picture in here. Uh, I was doing a class in Chicago a few years ago, and um, there was a young guy in the class who showed me a picture of second degree burns on his hand because he had tried to mate a Socapex connector and the connector had spun. So he shorted out the pins and it basically blew up in his hand and he got second degree burns. Now that's with a Socapex connector, which is number 12 wire, which is very small wire. If you do the same thing with 4 aught, which is much bigger wire, it's going to be much worse. So you want to turn off the switch. Now the switch can malfunction. So you want to use the three point test to verify that there's no voltage on that switch before you terminate your feeder cable. And how do you do that? Well, you take your tester, you know, you want to use a voltage sniffer or, or a voltage meter, voltmeter, and you want to test the tester first. So you go to a known circuit, you know, an outlet or whatever that you know is on has voltage. You test your tester, make sure it's working. Then you go to the switch and you, um, you, you check the voltage at the switch at the output make sure that the voltage is actually off. And then you go back to the known good circuit again and test your tester again, because what can happen if you're using a voltmeter, then the leads can break internally. So your meter will show numbers, but it won't register the voltage because your leads are broken. So you want to test the tester and, and then verify there's no voltage before you terminate your feeder cable. When you connect your feeder cable, Always connect your ground first. That's the green wire first. The neutral second, that's the white wire. Then your phase conductors last. That's your black, red, and blue. And on the out, after the show is over, you want to turn everything off. Because again, you don't want to break the connections while it's conducting current because that can cause an arc flash and that can burn you as well. So you want to turn everything off. Turn off all the circuit breakers on the distro. Um, and you want to verify there's no voltage. Now, this is where a voltage sniffer comes in really handy. That's a little uh, wand that you can buy for 30 bucks um, that will light up if there's voltage there. And you don't have to uh, touch a live exposed conductor. You can just touch the insulation. If there's voltage there, it'll light up and tell you that it's still on. So, so uh, you kill all, you know, turn off all the circuit breakers, check the voltage, then you disconnect the cables. But you do it in reverse. You disconnect the phase conductors first. Um, the neutral second, and then the ground conductor last. So um, the, the, um, there's a little um, proving unit that Fluke makes. I, I imagine there's other companies that make these as well. I just learned about these last, last year when we did a, a class at Disney. And the, the Disney techs are really good. They, they're very well trained. And they carry this unit around with them. So sometimes it's hard, you know, sometimes it's not convenient to find a live known, a known live source to test your tester. So they carry this proving unit around with them. You strap it to your belt and you can put your probes on it and it, it will check your meter, make sure your meter is working. So that's my next purchase once uh, when we get back to work. So, but I say work in pairs because I want the first person to terminate the cable and the second person comes and checks the work. Is it color to color? And here's the thing is it turns out that one out of every eight males is colorblind. 
So it's very easy to mix up your green and your blue connectors. And if you do that, you've grounded out your hot conductor. When you energize the switch, boom, it's going to blow up. So it's really important. And also, so even if you're not colorblind, depending on the lighting, it can be difficult to distinguish between blue and green connectors as well, because sometimes the sun will fade the colors. When, when we were doing a class recently, we at, at, this was actually at Disney last um, end of last year, beginning of this year. And uh, because the techs uh, worked the overnight shift, we had to do the class from 7 p.m. to 3 a.m., I think it was. So here we were at two o'clock in the morning out in the parking lot under um, sodium, sodium lamps. And uh, they had some feeder cable that had been used outdoors. The colors were faded. And somebody pointed out that if you hold up the two connectors side by side, one green, one blue, under the sodium vapor lamps, you could not tell the difference between the two. I don't care how good your vision was. It was almost indistinguishable. So you have to be really careful about that. So um, make sure all the circuit breakers are off before you tie everything in. Then sometimes you have inrush current. And so you want to turn the breakers on one at a time. Inrush is where you know, certain loads like... Uh, tungsten, big tungsten lamps, when you first turn them on, they draw a huge amount of current for a short amount of time. And uh, LED walls will do the same thing. So, um, so you stand to one side, turn your head, hold your breath, throw the switch. And I, and I, you know, I created this little illustration here because this is my memory of doing a show. We, I was on a tour once where we went into a theater and the, uh, the dimmer tech was, you know, this was his first tour. He just graduated from Belmont College in Nashville, and uh, he was he was responsible for setting up the distro. I was the uh, lighting director, and um, so I was busy setting up front of house. But the house electrician tied in the feeder switch, to, tied, in, tied in the feeder cable, and then left the theater. And the dimmer tech finished putting all the distro together. When when he turned on the switch, um, and I happened to be on stage when it happened, I heard what sounded like a shotgun blast. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw it looked like a ball of fire coming out of the switch. And he's really lucky that he was okay. He was shaking up quite a bit, but you know, the, it, it was a bad arc flash and it could have burned him, but he survived, you know, it, it missed him. <laughs> Basically the ball of fire went right by him. So that's why I say you stand on one side of the switch before you energize it, before you turn it on, you turn your head, you hold your breath because that air is going to be superheated. And if you get startled and you inhale, then you could, you could burn the lining of your lungs, but then you turn it on. So that's a safe way to do it, okay? Once you have energized the switch, then you want to verify the voltage. And so you want to go downstream as far as possible. You know, the further downstream you are in the distro, the smaller the wires, the safer it is. You know, so, and a lot of distros now have test ports. Use those test ports because they're small access ports that are connected to the bigger bus bars by a little bitty tiny wire. So it makes it much safer to test your voltage. And you, so you want to get a voltmeter and you want to put one probe on the black, one on the green. You should see 120 volts in North America. Um, if you go from red to green, it's 120, blue to green, 120. And then you check black to red should be 208, red to blue, 208, black to blue, 208, and then green to white should be zero volts. Now, sometimes you might get a little bit of voltage between green and white, but it should not be more than two or three volts. But that's the, uh, the proper way to meter for voltage. And whatever you do, do not, at the distro, do not just lift up a cam cover and put your probe on a cam connector. And I say that because, again, I do a lot of research in electrical safety. And I found this uh, accident report on the OSHA website in August, 2018, somebody had a portable power generator and they were trying to meter the voltage at the generator. So he lifted up the cam cover, put his probe on the volt probe on the, on the cam connector and he accidentally touched it and it killed him. So there's an example of why we don't do that. We need to go downstream to meter the voltage. Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip over a couple of these slides because I want to go to, um, oh, the, these are interesting. This, these pictures, uh, so I have a power quality meter and I'm metering, once, I, once you set it all up, then there's two things that you wanna look out for. Once you turn, all on, turn on all your loads, you're, you wanna monitor your cables for current, make sure you don't overload them. That implies you know the opacity of the cables. So, and the, the important ones would be 
your feeder cable. So uh, once again, four aught, uh, we consider to be good for 400 amps, two aught, 200 amps, and number two wire, which we call banded, uh, 100 amps. So the, um, uh, the other thing we look for is temperature. We want to, and I have a infrared camera. It's not very expensive. It's a FLIR one, F L I R one model one O N E. And you can get them now for $200. It it's put, goes on your iPhone or your Android. And it takes a quick picture of whatever you're looking at your distro, your cables, your connectors, and it tells you if something is overheating. So, but I, uh, I have this power quality meter, so I'm metering the current and you can see some of these waveforms should be a sine wave. Some of the current waveforms are distorted, which means there's harmonics, which is another issue altogether. Um, so the, uh, and, and again, if you have harmonics, you want to, well, maybe not again, but uh, if you have harmonics, you want to make sure you don't overload the neutral conductor because when you have high harmonic content, that's what can, that's one of the things that can happen is you can overload the neutral. And that implies, you know, the opacity of the neutral conductor. So you, so you have to look at the wire gauge on the neutral and make sure that you're not conducting more than its opacity. So again, if it's four out 400 amps, here's an example of my infrared camera capturing. Um, you can measure the, the, the heat on a connector in this case, 47.5. Now, again, this implies, you know, the temperature rating of the con of the uh, conductors and the connectors you're using. So um, you can you can monitor connectors, um, conductors, feeder transformers. Uh, here's an example where this um, at in the morning this feeder cable I measured 97.6 degrees C, uh, which is not beyond the temperature rating. But then an hour later it was 104.9 C, which is higher than the temperature rating of the, um, of the bus bar. The bus, is, the bus is rated to 90 C. So that's, that, that was a big issue that we had to take care of. So there's some um, examples of just, you know, you can videotape it, you can take still pictures, but you can look and see if your connectors and your cables are being overheated. And if you find something, of course, make sure you mark it. So when it goes back to the shop that they know exactly what the problem is. Don't be uh, obscure about it, um, you know. And if you want, if you don't have an infrared camera, you can use the back of your hand to monitor the heat. So you should know if you're a working electrician, you should know what normal feels like. If you have a four aught cable, what does, and it's conducting 250 amps, you know, how hot should it get, right? But use the back of your hand, not the front. Grounding is a hugely important issue, and that's one I want to talk about real quick, but I'm going to skip down to, okay, here, here we go. So there's a lot of confusion about the purposes of the, uh, what we call the ground. And really there's two different things we're talking about when we refer to ground. One is the connection to the earth with the grounding rod, and that is completely separate from the green wire that connects to the equipment. So if we have a piece of gear, there's a power cable that has a black wire, a white wire, and a green wire. The green wire is actually connected to the metal chassis. That's this dotted line. And under normal circumstances, when everything is working right, the current goes through the black wire, through the load, back through to the supply through the white wire. But if there's a fault and something shorts out, like a friend of mine, for example, was working on a moving light, and um, when she put it back together, she accidentally pinched the hot wire between two pieces of metal and it cut the insulation and shorted it out to the chassis. So now the conductive chassis takes the current and it passes it through the green wire. And because there's no, nothing to impede the flow of current, it's a direct short, so it'll trip the circuit breaker. So that's its intended purpose. Notice this path has nothing to do with the earth. Here's the earth over here. There's no current flowing to the earth. This is strictly going through the hot, through the chassis, through the green wire. So why do we call this a grounding conductor? That's the, you know, why do we call that ground? Uh, it you know, I like to refer to it as the bonding conductor because it's bonded to the metal chassis. And its function is uh, to make sure the circuit breaker trips in the event that something goes haywire over here. It has nothing to do with the connection to the earth. So if you lift the ground, then what you're doing is you're eliminating that path for fault current. Should there be a fault, now the chassis has voltage on it. 
but there's no nothing to trip the circuit breaker. So the voltage will stay on that chassis. Now, if somebody comes along and touches it, they complete the path for fault current through the earth back to the supply. And that's how people get killed because somebody lifted the ground. So under no circumstances is it ever okay to use a ground lift adapter to lift the ground. Those are actually made to, you know, back in, um, we didn't start using green wires in electrical circuits until 1963. And until then, that meant that all of the outlets had, were two-pronged outlets and there was no grounding pin. So those buildings are still around. So if you go into an older building and you have a modern day device with the three-prong connector, but you have a two-prong receptacle, it won't fit. So you, you use this adapter to go from three prongs to two. But you'll notice that little green tab down there that's, that's very important. That's there for a reason. The purpose is that if you uh, to unscrew the faceplate of that two-prong receptacle and you put that screw through the green tab and plug in your device and then you screw, the, the, uh, screw back into the junction box, if the junction box is metal and if there's metal conduit, now, your modern-day device, the green wire is connected to building steel. It is properly bonded or grounded, as you would call it. So if something goes wrong, it will trip the circuit breaker. But if you don't do that, now you've broken the safety mechanism that protects people from getting shocked, which is why it's never okay under any circumstances to lift the ground. Now, that's a common practice in our industry. I, talked, I see and I talk to people all the time who use who carry these around and they use them to to cure ground loops and that's the wrong way to get rid of a ground loop the the proper way is to use a um a ground uh, a um, audio isolation transformer like um the uh like a sescom um you know or or to build an adapter where pin one doesn't connect to pin one but otherwise, you're, you're literally putting people's lives at risk. And that's a practice that has to stop. And the only way it's going to stop is if we um, raise awareness and we understand the causes. The, you know, what is the purpose of bonding? What is the purpose of grounding? What is the purpose of the green wire? And what happens if we break that connection? And this is exactly what's going on. So, so hopefully, you know, um, given time and given the right resources and, and the right training, you know, I don't think anybody ever intentionally wants to put anybody's life at risk. So if we understand what we're doing, then I think that we'll naturally phase that out, which is what we need to do. So now there's one other thing that I wanted to cover. Um, and I'll be happy to take questions as well. Um, but I definitely wanted to talk about, oh, here's, okay. So um, actually a couple of things real quickly. So so uh, the, the green wire, in, I took this picture, this is the inside of a moving light, it's bonded to the metal chassis. But anytime you have electricity in proximity of a conductive piece of metal, whether it's a stage, whether if you put lights on a lift like they do in the movie industry, it should be bonded. That means the green grounding conductor from the distro should be connected to the metal chassis. And, and here's why. Uh, same with truss, with stages, with catwalks. Here's why. So. And you can see this on YouTube, but here's a singer who um, he's he, right now he's upstage center. You're going to watch him walk downstage left there. You're going to see a scaffold. There's some lights hanging off the scaffold that have malfunctioned and they put voltage on the on the scaffold. So when he comes along, I don't know if you can hear the music or not, but he's going to and I'm going to advance this because whoops, I went too far. OK, let me. I'm trying to go, okay, here we go. So he's walking down stage left. He's going to touch the scaffold and he's going to get a shock. You'll see over his left shoulder, there's a puff of smoke and he jumps off the stage. He's okay. He lives, he survives, but he got a bad shock because that scaffold was not bonded. So I don't know if you could hear that music or not. It was very loud in my, in my headphones. If, if it was drowning out what I was saying, we walked down stage, he grabbed the, the scaffold he got a shock and he couldn't, he said he couldn't let go. So he jumped off the stage to save his life, which is probably the right thing to do. He was badly shaken. He did survive uh, probably only because he is big strapping, healthy guy. Um, I've, I've tried to reach out to him to, to get his uh, story 
but uh, he won't reply to my Facebook mess private messages. So if you're out there, you know, um, I just love to talk to you. But anyway, so the point is that everything should be bonded. If if that scaffold had been properly bonded, then what would have happened is when they hung those lights on the scaffold and they shorted out to the to the scaffold, it would have tripped the circuit breaker. You know, um, I worked a show last year, big convent, big uh, uh, um, industrial show where there were two big stages and we were sitting at lunch eating and um, I was talking to the production manager and somebody came and told him that the other stage, um, if you touched it, you got a tingle. So the production manager sent an electrician over there. So he, the electrician grabbed his meter, jumped in the golf cart and took off. And about 30 minutes later, he came back and said, well, I found the problem. And the problem was that a carpenter had driven a nail in the set and it pierced a hot conductor and shorted out to the metal chassis of the stage and it put 120 volts on the stage. And so he said, so I pulled the nail, problem gone. But the, the problem is he didn't really address the problem. He, he addressed the symptom of the problem. The problem was that the stage was not bonded because if the stage was bonded, the instant the carpenter pierced the hot conductor and it shorted out to the stage, it would have tripped the circuit breaker. So it should be bonded. Everything should be bonded. Okay. Um, now I'm going to go down to, uh, this is my uh, fluke. Um, they call it a volt alert. It's a voltage sniffer, but that's what I carry around with me to, to find stray voltage and also verify that there's no voltage before I tie in to the switch. Okay. One last thing I want to, and I'm going to, See if I can skip down here to get to GFCIs because I think this is uh, an important topic. So let me just find the slide here, if I may. Bear with me a moment. Uh, um, right. Yeah. Okay. Here. Here we go. So. Now I can't see to, <laughs> I need to slideshow. There we go. P play from current slide. Here we go. All right. So um, let's talk about GFCIs real quick because anytime you use there. So first of all, there is a recommended practice for the use of class A GFCIs in the entertainment industry. And, but, and, but basically in a nutshell, what it says is anytime you use electricity in the proximity of moisture or water, it should be on GFCI protection. And, and the, the reason is that again, if you, if your skin is wet, then th your resistance is very low. And so if you get shocked, it's much more dangerous because the, um, the, the current will be much higher. And so remember this IEC chart that we talked about. And so th here's the way GFCIs work. So um, it, there's, a, there's a sense coil and the hot conductor of the circuit and the neutral are run through the center of the sense coil. And under normal circumstances, you know, here's the load over here, here's the supply. And under normal circumstances, the outgoing current and the return current are equal in opposite directions. So the magnetic fields they create cancel out and nothing happens. But if, the, uh, if there's a fault or if somebody's being shocked, then the outgoing current is higher than the return current. And that generates a magnetic field, which puts voltage on this integrated circuit chip, which turns on this solenoid and it opens the switching contacts. And that happens in a class A GFCI. And that's like, if you go down to Lowe's or Home Depot, and you buy a GFCI off the shelf or all, you know, the, all the ones that are in your house, in your kitchen, your bathroom, your garage, outside, those are all class A devices. And a class A has to trip if there's six milliamps or, of leakage or more within 5.59 seconds. And so that makes them personnel protection devices because if you look at um, this IEC chart, um, six milliamps and 5.59 seconds is barely into the yellow. But it turns out most manufacturers actually beat that spec by about 50%. So they will actually trip down here in the green zone, which means that they will save your life. Now, that's true of 99% of the world's population. So it's not 100% guaranteed that a GFCI will save somebody's life. It depends a lot really on the condition of their health, their age. You know, So the, um, the most susceptible um, parts of the population would be infants and elderly people. 
and people with compromised health. So if you're working with any of those, you have to be especially vigilant, especially careful. Uh, even if you're using GFCIs, uh, you have to take care of them. Now, the other thing about GFCIs is that they have a lot of components in them. And I think I, I may have, that's, there's a better drawing of that circuit, but uh, yeah, here we go. This is a GFCI that met death by hammer for your educational benefit. And you can see, here's the integrated circuit chip. Here's an, a silicon controlled rectifier, which is basically an electronic switch. This is a metal oxide varistor, a voltage surge um, protection device. This is the solenoid, but there's capacitors, there's uh, resistors, there's all kinds, of, there's a sense coil, all kinds of components. And any one of those components can fail at any time which will leave you without protection. And there's no outward indication on the older GFCIs that they have failed, which means you have to test them periodically. So your homework tonight from this, uh, this webinar, go into your bathroom, test your GFCIs, go into your kitchen. And it's really easy to do. There's a test and reset button. Um, you press the test button. You should hear it click. It'll shut off. You press the reset button. It'll click back. It'll start back up again. So go check them in your garage outside. Make sure they're all working because here's the thing. They have so many components, they fail. And I read an article recently that said about 18% of the GFCIs that, out of a random sample of in people's houses, 18% are not working. So if you find they're not working, they're there for a reason. Replace them, fix them before somebody gets hurt. Now, the modern day GFCIs are different. The, you know, the old GFCI like this one, if it fails, it still passes voltage. It still passes current. But the modern day ones are built so that if any of these components fail, it will not work. So that's a little bit better. So, but anyway, um, anytime you use electricity in proximity or moisture water, it should be on GFCI protection. There's all kinds of form factors you can get. You can get, um, you know, stringer boxes. You can get these portable GFCIs. I real, I'm a big fan of because they're, they're relatively inexpensive. You can get them now for about $15. Um, and I carry a handful of these around with me. Whenever I work shows, I offer them freely to anybody who wants to use them because uh, we don't want another Augustine Briolini, you know? So had they, instead of lifting the ground, or if, if, you know, if they did, even if they did lift the ground, if they used a GFCI, um, then Augustine Briolini would be alive today. So, you know, for a $20 device, it, we could have saved Augustine Briolini's life had these techs known. So, yeah, uh, we don't want another, another incident like that. So, um, does, are there any questions so far? Is anybody, is anybody monitoring that? Yeah, we have a handful of questions. If you're ready to start the Q&A. Sure, let's do that. Okay, perfect. So the first question is, in South Africa, we usually run sound power on generators three phase, 63 and 32A distro to 16A power outlets. Sometimes the electrical engineer gets the wiring wrong. And even with the earth spike, we would still get shocked. Why would that be? Well, there can be lots of reasons. It could be uh, faulty insulation. It could be faulty um, wiring. Um, the, the important thing now, see, here's a common misconception. He said, even with the earth spike, the earth spike has nothing whatsoever to do with clearing a fault on a chassis. What does have to do with that is the, on the power cable. Now in, in, in South Africa, I assume you're going by British power. So it's going to be uh, brown, blue, and green with the yellow stripe. So the green wire with the yellow stripe is bonded to the metal chassis. In other words, it's connected to the metal chassis. If that is missing, or if it's broken, if it's uh, if the connector doesn't have the grounding pin on it, then the the brown wire can come in contact with. Is that right? The brown is the hot. I think it can come in contact with the uh, chassis, and there's nothing there to fix that. If the green wire with the yellow stripe is connected properly. As soon as the brown wire shorts out to the chassis, boom, it'll trip that circuit breaker and it'll clear that fault. But it has nothing whatsoever to do with the earth spike. The earth spike is there for lightning protection. So if you get a lightning strike um, and uh, there's no earth connection, a lightning, is a lightning bolt is a huge amount of energy and energy cannot be created, cannot be destroyed. It can only change forms. And if you do not give it a 
easy path into a big mass like the earth, then it's going to stay concentrated. It's going to be very destructive. So it'll burst into flame or it'll explode. So the connection to the earth is only there to funnel that lightning energy into the earth. And it's also there to serve as a good, stable zero volt reference, but it really has nothing whatsoever to do with what you're talking about. So in your case, I would highly recommend that you wear thick leather gloves, wear rubber soled shoes, preferably EH rated shoes. Now they may call it something else in South Africa. I've, I've never had the, um, I've never been fortunate enough to work a show in South Africa. I'd love to go. So uh, look me up next time you need somebody. Um, but so, and then also make sure you carry a voltage sniffer um, so that you can test for the presence of voltage before somebody gets shocked. Perfect. We had a lot of questions come in asking if this material or the PowerPoint um, is somewhere. Did you want to put up your um, contact screen? slide so that they may contact you? Um, I would be happy to. Um, how can I do that? <laughs> do you have a slide with like your contact information at the end? It's I think the, first slide. I th the yeah, the first, first, or the first slide. slide. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let me go to that and go. Yeah. Here is my, there it is. And how do I, oh, slideshow. Come on. There we go. There we go. Okay, so there's my email address. I'll be happy to share this with you. Just uh, reach out to me and Perfect. Um, I will do that. We still have a handful of questions, so I'll move on Great. to the next one. Is sure. it true that PowerCon true one pins can sometimes get misaligned? Yes. Uh, um, Neutrik sent out a bulletin that the it is possible to, um, to 180 those. So there is a fix for that. And I don't remember off the top of my head, but if you go to the Neutrik website and you just do a search for true one, um, true one bulletin, then you should be able to find that. Perfect. The next question is why are isolation transformers for touring audio often loud? Ah, <laughs> yeah. So we talked a bit about that. Um, so those, uh, so what, what they're talking about is um, oftentimes um, audio crews, sometimes video crews as well, will carry around their own feeder transformer so that um, they have, they have uh, cleaner power. Because if you just use house power, now you could get induced noise from the uh, lighting dimmers, especially, and from rigging motors, especially, which can uh, wreak havoc on the, the uh, noise bed for audio. So if you have an uh, audio isolation transformer, then that effectively is a barrier between all of the noise that's on the house electrical system and your audio system. It's a very, very good way of uh, having cleaner power. The reason that any transformer is loud is because it is uh, it is, especially if it's portable, it's been tossed around a lot. It's been uh, moved around a lot and it's basically starting to go into failure mode. The louder it is, the, the closer it is to it, its end of life. And the reason that they get loud is because if you, you know, an audio, a, a, any transformer is two windings, you know, you take a coil of wire, you wind it around a core and then you wind another one on top of that. And that's the secondary winding. And that core that it's wound on, um, in order to make the transformers more efficient, is laminated. So if it is, you know, say four inches thick, it'll have a bunch of uh, quarter inch laminations that are glued together. And that increases the efficiency of a transformer. And a transformer is the most efficient machine that humankind has ever built when they're brand new. They should be around 98% efficient. But as time goes by, then these laminations start to come apart and the magnetic field causes them to vibrate and that causes them to, to, to delaminate further. And um, that leads to downward spiral. They get hot, they get loud, and eventually, you know, the whole thing's going to fall apart. And so um, one way you can tell for sure, and I just figured this out, you know, I've been, uh, when I was in college, and studying electrical engineering, it was highly theoretical. Everything was math. You know, they didn't teach us any practical information whatsoever. And I've, I've spent the last, you know, 30 plus years 
uh, trying to connect the dots between the theoretical and the real world. And it just occurred to me about a year and a half ago that you can actually, uh, if you can measure the incoming voltage and current on, a, on a, this, the primary side of a feeder transformer and measure the outgoing voltage and current on a feeder transformer and take the ratio of the two and it should be close to 100%. And if it, uh, it, it in real in the real world, it's going to be like for a brand new feeder transformer, it should be about 98 percent. And the older and more and closer it, uh, transformer is to failure mode, the lower that percentage is going to be. So if you get down around 92 percent, think about this. If you have 150 kVA feeder transformer and you take 8 percent of that energy and convert it to heat and, and noise. <laughs> that is a lot of heat and a lot of noise. So, you know, a, a drop in, per, in uh, percent efficiency means a lot of noise and a lot of heat. So that's why that's happening. So if you have one that's excessively loud, then it sh really should be repaired or retired. Perfect. The next question is, are cam locks still in use? If yes, shouldn't they be replaced by power locks? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I've said this for many years. I, I'm in total agreement. I'm not a big fan of cam locks. Um, I think power locks are much better. And the, in, in case you're unfamiliar, um, a, a power lock looks very much like a cam lock connector, except when they're not mated, there's a plastic cam that closes down that prevents you from putting your finger or your tongue in there. So they're much safer to use, but we don't use them in North America for some unknown reason. I, maybe it's that they cost more money. I don't know. That's a, that's a change I would like to see implemented in our industry. Uh, I don't see it happening though. Um, they do use them uh, more in Europe than they use them here, but um, I, I would sure like to see that happen here. Perfect. The next question is, should access SoCo cables be figured eight as well? Does the magnetic field work the same as the feeder cable does? Okay, I didn't catch all of that. You cut out a little bit. Do what cables? Yes, I'll reread it. Should access SoCo cables be figured eight as well? And the second part is, does the magnetic field work the same as feeder cable does? Okay. Um, okay. Do excess Socapex cables, sh should they be uh, figure eight as well? And the answer is no. Um, so a Socapex cable is a branch circuit, which means you have a, uh, a black conductor and a white conductor, or in the case of Europe, it's a, it's a brown and a, and a blue. And that means that at any point in time, the current in one conductor is in one direction, the other conductor is in the opposite direction. So that means the magnetic field is canceling out. So um, if you have excess SACO cable or SACOPEX cable, you can figure eight it just for neatness purposes, but you're not doing it. It has nothing to do with magnetism or anything like that because there really is almost no magnetism whatsoever in a branch circuit. So whether it's SACO, whether it's a stinger cable or extension cord, um, if you are, if you're, uh, coiling it, or if you're figuring eight, figure eighting it, that's for neatness only, which counts matters. I, and I applaud that, but you're not doing it because of any magnetism or any power factor reasons. Got it. The next question is where does the generator get grounded? If you're running power inside a building to the earth in the parking lot or to the building steel, or do you do both and connect them together? Great question, um, and it's important that you do that. So the uh, if you're running portable power generator into a building, you, you have to make sure that the generator ground is bonded to the building ground because otherwise you could have a difference in potential and that could be potentially uh, harmful or lethal. So the according to code, you need to, to bond it to as close to the power source, to the... Uh, uh, to the service panel as possible. So if you, you know, the, the service entrance in the building is where the power comes into the building. And in the old days, it used to be easy to find the service entrance because it was always aerial overhead. These days you have a lot of underground power. It's not quite as easy, but if you can locate the service panel that, you know, and, and if you, if it's an older building, you can walk the perimeter of the outside of the building and look for where the lines come into the building. If it's a newer building, then you're going to have to look for an electrical closet that has a service panel. And once you find the service panel, there will be a copper bus in there somewhere, and you'll see all the bare copper wires connected to it. That is the uh, connected to the building grounding electrode. That's where you should bond to. 
And sometimes they make it easy, sometimes they don't, but there should be a way to bond to it. But that's what you want. You, and you want to be as close to the service panel as possible. If you, if you can't find that, like for example, I was talking to a gaffer a couple of months ago and they were doing a um, location shoot in, a, in some random house that they, that they scouted and he had a portable power generator and he wanted to make sure he was bonded to the uh the house power ground which is the right thing to do so he went to the uh now in this case there's not going to be a well i guess there would be a, a service panel would be the breaker panel but but oftentimes in a house the uh grounding electrode is the plumbing pipe so if you can if you you need but you need if you're going to use the, the plumbing pipe you need to make sure it's copper <laughs> not pvc and need need to bond to it within five feet of where it goes into the in, into the building so you know that it's actually a copper connection and it's actually earthed so um you know but you want to make sure the important thing is you want to make sure you have continuity uh low impedance between the building ground and the uh, generator uh, ground. And the way that I like to verify it is I will take an extension cord and plug it into a courtesy outlet on the portable power generator. And then I can take my multimeter and put it in ohms mode or in continuity mode. And I'll put one probe in the grounding pin in the extension cord. And that allows me to walk over to the building steel or to the grounding electrode in the building and put the other probe on the ground and read the uh, continuity between the building ground and the generator ground. And you should have a very low impedance uh, connection there. Perfect. The next question is, in a concert environment, who is responsible for bo bounding the stage to the ground? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and unfortunately, it's one that uh, in practice, we don't often do that. And I don't, I don't know that... Uh, anybody is uh, taking responsibility for that. Um, I would say that the, um, ideally the, the head electrician should make sure that the, the stage is properly bonded, but oftentimes that doesn't happen. And I think the, you know, there's not a huge number of accidents. I showed you that video of that scaffold, you know, that's an example where it, that should have been bonded. Um, but if, if there were, um, a huge number of accidents like that, we'd probably probably be more vigilant, but I think it's important to do so that we don't have a spate of accidents like that. So I would say, you know, um, the, the uh, electricians should be responsible. They should take the responsibility. It should be incumbent upon them. They shouldn't wait to be told to do it. Just, you know, just uh, make sure to do it. When I'm working a show, once we have everything set up, then um, if we have time, and we're sitting around doing nothing, I'll often go and check for that, those kinds of things. Perfect. The next question is, can you recommend classes to take from the novice who wants to start learning to the professional who just misses working? Hey, I happen to know a guy. Uh, that guy is me, actually. And, you know, I'm not here to, to blow my own horn or promote myself or anything. But there, you know, um, I do have some online classes. So again, um, email me. I'll be happy to, to tell you about them. There's, uh, as far as other resources go, you know, community colleges um, always have great um, electricity courses. That's a great place to start. But as far as industry specific, um, there, I mean, there's, there are a couple of people around who do uh, the occasional class. But as far as I know, and, and again, I, you know, I, I hate to, um, I, I don't know. I'm, I, I, I'm trying to be modest, but uh, I don't know a lot of people who, who teach these. I'm one of them. So, you know, send me an email. We can talk about it. Okay. Thank you. Great. The next question is, uh, just to clarify, if a ground has been lifted on a cable, a GFCI will still protect the system? Yeah. Yes, it absolutely will. And this is one of the myths about GFCIs that I often hear. People say, oh, um, if you, if you don't have a ground, then a GFCI doesn't work. It absolutely does work. In fact, um, if you have an older building that was built before 1963 that has no green wire in it, and I, I can uh, testify to this because we have a lake house that was built in 1950, and uh, part of it, uh, there's a, it's a two-wire system, and I, I went through and I put in GFCIs because you're required by the National Electrical Code should you remodel that home, it's required by code to have to replace those two prong outlets with GFCIs and they work just fine without the green wire. 
Another very common myth I hear is that you cannot plug a GFCI into a GFCI, which is absolutely not true. I, I used to do it all the time before the pandemic when we traveled. Any hotel room you go in, the bathroom, there's a GFCI outlet on the wall and the, the hair dryer now has the, the connector has a GFCI on it. And where do you plug it in? You plug it right into GFCI. So you're plugging a GFCI into a GFCI and it always works. It's never an issue. So you don't need a ground for GFCI to work. In fact, if you don't have a ground, I highly recommend that you put it on GFCI protection because that way, it, you know, the lack of the ground is what kills people. And the use of a GFCI is what saves people's lives. Perfect. So we have quite a few more questions if you still have time. Absolutely. Bring them. Perfect. The next question is, what is your thought about the use of voltage boosters? Uh, well, you know, there's, there's many occasions where you should, uh, you need to use them. Um, uh, a buck boost transformer is often used if you're touring Europe with American gear, you need a, you need a buck boost transformer to go from um, 240 to 120 or vice versa. If you're using European gear in the United States, you need a, a buck boost transformer to go from 120 to 240. So there are absolutely um, applications where they can be, where they should be used. I know uh, oftentimes video projection companies will use them if they have long runs of power where you have excessive voltage drop and you need to get the voltage back up in order to uh, make sure that the project, the big, you know, 20K, 30K ANSI lumen projectors work and there's nothing wrong with that. Now, what, uh, what, I, what I wouldn't recommend is if you have excessive voltage drop and, and if you're unfamiliar with the concept of voltage drop, what happens is if you have very long runs of cable or if the um, wire gauge is too small for the amount of current they're carrying, then you're going to have a lot of voltage that's dropped across the cable, which means there's less voltage applied to the load. Sometimes when people see this happening, they go out to the portable power generator and crank up the voltage. And that, that uh, it's not a good idea because first of all, there's two different types of loads. There are passive loads and there's active loads. And if it's a passive load, that if you increase the voltage at the generator, that's going to increase the current, which increases the voltage drop, which makes the problem worse, not better. And you're going to burn up the cables. Um, if you have an active load and you boost the voltage at the portable power generator, you're asking that generator to work a lot harder and it's going to get, it's going to be hotter and it's going to um, accelerate the aging of that generator. So it's not a good practice in general to do that. If, if, if you have too much voltage drop, that's a symptom of a problem. And the problem is your cables aren't big enough, you know, cross-sectional diameter is not big enough or they're too long for the amount of current that you're, that you're running. So you can either move the load closer to the sort, to the supply or get bigger cables. That's the, the right thing to do in that, in those instances. Perfect. The next question is, you mentioned earlier that number two size feeder is good for 100 amps. Is it possible for it to handle a little more? Do you put your foot down if you see someone using a number two for 150 or even 100 or even 200 amps of power? Yeah, well, the answer is you go to the National Electrical Code in, in the United States and other places too, but um, th there's a chart you can look up what the actual ampacity is for those conductors. Now, the reason that I don't like to push it is because they're also what are called derating factors. And um, so the, um, for example, if you have two or three or four or more current carrying conductors in contact with each other, those are derating factors. So if you have, so in our world in the United States or North America, actually, uh, we typically have uh, in a five wire set of feeder cable that four of those are conducting current. The only one that's not is the grounding. Hopefully not. The ground is not. But you have four current carrying conductors. If, if those wires are touching each other, you're supposed to derate the ampacity by 20%. So we say a four out conductor is good for 400 amps, but only a single conductor in free air is actually 400 amps. If they're touching the other wires, you derate it 20% if there's four of them. So that makes it a, a 300, let's see, 80% uh, of 400, 320 amp uh, ampacity conductor. That's one derating factor. Then you have 
um, the, if the ambient air temperature is too high, if you're working outdoors and it's hotter than, and I forget what the number is, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, no, it's more than that. Um, whatever that number is, 40 C, I think it is. But if it's too hot, then you derate the ampacity again. And another factor would be if you're, if they're running in cable ramps or in conduit or raceway, you derate it as well. So uh, the easy thing to do is leave overhead, always leave 20% overhead. You don't want to push it to its maximum. And um, if, if it comes down to it and you're running out of capacity, then you can break out the, the, the charts and the books and you can start calculating the actual impacities based on the conditions. Perfect. The next question is, why are ADA taps still used indoors and outside when they don't have a ground? That's a great question. And the answer is uh, because of something called double insulation. So if a device you're using that you, play, that you power up has a metal chassis, it has to have a ground, a green wire and a grounding pin, or in Europe, a green and yellow stripe wire and a grounding pin. If it has a plastic ch uh, chassis, then it doesn't. So for example, this is my computer power supply I just unplugged. And notice that it has a two prong connector. And this is a modern day device. It's perfectly code compliant. But the reason they're allowed to put a two prong connector, not a three prong connector, is because the case is made of plastic. And that case is, is insulated. Now the wires inside are insulated and the case is insulated. That makes it double insulation. So if that wire breaks and shorts out to the chassis, it's not going to become a shock hazard. So if you have, um, if you have a plastic case, if it's double insulated like a drill that's met, you know, with a plastic case, it does not need a ground. The other answer to that is often ADA taps are used in the motion picture industry. And, and um, there's an article in the National Electrical Code, Article 530, that spells out what, what you can do. And it's much more liberal for uh, shooting movies than for anything else because those people are much more highly trained than the average bear in our industry. They, they, in order to, you know, if you've ever worked in Hollywood, if, before you set foot on a studio lot, you have to get, get a safety pass, which is, means you have to go and get trained. You have to go to a bunch of classes and you get certified in all these different areas before you're even allowed to set foot on the lot. So um, because those people um, are very well trained, they get more latitude than the average electrician in our industry. Perfect. Um, the next question is, where do ground and neutral get bonded? Ah, good question. So they're grounded at the service, or they're, sorry, they're bonded <laughs> at the service entrance. And so, and they should only be bonded once and only once. And sometimes the, the, uh, the bond is off premises. If you have a feeder transformers off premise, um, that, then in that case, they would be bonded in the service panel, but the, the, uh, they, it, it's either, they're either bonded at the supply or in the service panel, but no more than once. So if there's more than one bond, that means you're going to have one of the return paths for the normal return paths for current is going to be through the ground and you don't want that. So that's why there has to be only one, but typically you'll find it in the, in the service panel, or if it's not in the service panel, if there's a feeder transformer on premises, it'll be in the feeder transformer or in the portable power generator. Perfect. So the questions do keep coming in. So I'm going to ask one more. And then if we didn't get to your question, please feel free to reach out to Richard. Um, like he mentioned, yeah. his contact information Absolutely. is up on the screen. So the next question is, if there is a short in a lighting instrument, sorry, incandescent plugged into a dimmer rack and it starts to spark, why does the breaker on the dimmer trip? Should it trip? If there's a, sh I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Of course. Again? If there is a short in a lighting instrument, incandescent, plugged into a dimmer rack, and it starts to spark, why does the breaker on the dimmer trip? Should it trip? Yeah, it absolutely should trip. Um, now, you know, sparking is a uh, relative term because it, it, um, what, what's going to cause the circuit breaker to trip is the amount of current flowing through it. And you can have an arcing uh, situation where very little current is flowing. And then on the other hand, you can have an arcing situation where a lot of current is flowing. So it really depends on how much it's arcing, how big the, the arc is, how much current is in the arc. 
but the circuit protection is in the dimmer and that's where it should trip and it should trip. And, and um, if it, if it doesn't, um, this, this can, this will be a problem because over time that arc will heat up and it could cause a fire. It could melt the wires. It could melt, um, you know, the plastic, if there is plastic. So um, hopefully if it's going to arc, it'll arc badly enough that it will draw enough current through the ground that will trip the uh, circuit breaker. Perfect. Well, Richard, I want to thank you so much for your time. This was a great presentation. And thank you everyone who has joined us. Again, Richard's contact information is up on the screen if we weren't able to get to your question today. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Namaste, y'all. Great, great time. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Bye, Brad. guys.